Hello lovely friends, how are you all doing today? I hope you are well. I am cosy, <laughs> cosy at home. Um, it's another book one, yay! Oh, it's such a joy this time of year. I don't feel any guilt about reading. Once those daylight hours have gone, I can't be in the garden. Anyway, yeah, no guilt. So, as mentioned, it's a few weeks ago now, and I said, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back in time and pull out bits of books that I've talked about amongst all sorts of other things on previous sort of sofa chats. Um, yeah, I'm gonna pull them out so they're little standalone videos. So anyone who's particularly interested in just watching about one or two specific books can do. So we're going to do a bit of that today, uh, a fairly recent one, but before that, a new book to talk about. I've just finished reading Adam Schultz's Beyond the Trees, subtitle, A Journey Alone Across Canada's Arctic. So Beyond the Trees is reference to, he's gone above the tree line in terms of, not in elevation, in terms of latitude. He's gone up into the Arctic Circle. Goodness me, how fascinating. Oh, so first of all, I should just say thank you to Pat, who is Canadian and who sent me this book. Thank you, lovely. Um, so our man, Adam Schultz, in his spare time, he's a canoeist. That's what he likes to do. What's his sort of full-time job? It describes him as being historian, archaeologist, geographer, oh, and explorer in residence of the Royal Canadian Geographical Society. He's an explorer. For Brits, uh, I know most of you watching are Brits, he's, it seems like he's Canada's young upcoming version of Ranulph Fiennes. So the premise of the book, uh, Canada had their 150th anniversary of being Canada. Obviously Canada existed before 150 years ago. So I think this is 2018 he did this quest. Uh, so to mark that anniversary, there were all sorts of things going on. He decided he wanted to do something to mark that anniversary and decided he would canoe <laughs> across the Arctic, across Northern Canada. Absolutely crazy idea. I'll give you a quick flash of the map. So over here, we've, just to give you your setting, we've got Alaska. Here's a bit of Northern Canada. There's a bit more over here. <laughs> and all those, all the kind of the, the provinces that we that we're all familiar with where most people live down here up here this is the edge of Hudson's Bay Hudson Bay or is it Hudson's Hudson so the premise is he's going to canoe <laughs> this it's crazy which um it's a combination of rivers and lakes if you look at a satellite map of this area you will see it's it's the most I think it's the most belaked and berivered place on that on the entire planet. Now the thing is, when we look at a map like that, we think, oh yeah, so it's four thousand kilometers. We look at a map and we think, oh okay. What's not clear from the map is is the terrain, the territory. <laughs> that he's going across and I was thinking about this quite early on in the book about how when we look at a map and we see names of places you know Whitehorse, Dawson, anyone who's read anything about that area will know of those towns those will be familiar you know we see Fort Good Hope we see these place names and and I think what it does subconsciously is it gives us sort of a false sense of safety, security, of the known rather than the unknown. Whereas in fact, that place name, it could represent nothing more than a tiny little cabin with no facilities. 
no, there's no, there's no population, there's no facilities, there are no people, there are no amenities. So, you know, as soon as I got the book, I love a book with a map. I looked at the map and I thought, oh yes, I recognise Whitehorse, Dawson, I recognise re recognise those names. But it's it sort of it, it's a it's a bit of a false start up here because actually, where he's going is unpopulated the chances of him seeing another human being are little to none and this whole quest takes him four months it's hard for us to imagine so hard for us to imagine now the main the big thing about adam schultz is his his passion for the wilderness for wildlife he's obviously very very much a loner can't comprehend the idea of living in a city, being surrounded by people and buildings. And you know, he wants to be out there and he wants to be out there on his own. And I think that tells us a lot about him. Um, and I, I think anyone exploring going to such remote places on their own, they have to be a bit mad. <laughs> they must be a bit mad because, of course, it's not a safe thing to do. But that's why we as armchair explorers love these kind of books so much is because we can read it, enjoy that adventure, be a bit scared at times, but ultimately we're safe because we're sitting at home in the warm. I mean, what a stupid book to read in winter, one that's all about being cold. Uh, yeah, so we have, our, we have that kind of safety of, of being at home. And I think, as I was reading it and thinking about he must be a bit mad, <laughs> in the same way that I think Ranulph Fiennes must be a bit mad. And I also think possibly these people are are probably quite difficult to be with. Ranulph Fiennes is the first to, to say that of himself. He's a difficult man to be with. Um, more of that about him in a minute. So... I was expecting, within the first few pages, it's all about the idea is born to do this quest, to do this adventure. Um, and it's how he sort of puts it together. And there was one point where everything is ready, we're ready to start this adventure. And I actually sort of said out loud, I might even have clapped, oh, we're going on an adventure, yay. <laughs> um, be honest the book went downhill from there oh I feel I feel awful saying it I want to say right from the outset with this that what he achieved is stunning remarkable astounding crazy amazing there's no doubt about it that he as an explorer achieved something truly astonishing and to do it on his own with I think he had two no he had three resupplies supply drops where you know, a seaplane comes in, lands on a lake and replenishes his food stores. But otherwise, he's on his own and incredibly dangerous terrain. So many things could have gone wrong. Obviously, they don't. We know that from the outset. That's another bit of safety for us as a reader. We know he's going to be OK because he lives to tell the tale. Um, so, yeah, from the outset, I'm going to say what he achieved is truly remarkable. Overall, I was interested to read the book. However, I'll be perfectly honest, uh, it's 270 pages. And on about page 220, I skim read through to about 200 page 50 or so to get to the end and then read the end. Because it becomes incredibly repetitive. <laughs> it's really repetitive. I don't know how, uh, you know, any other way to say it, and I don't mean it uh, with any unkindness, but paragraph after paragraph after paragraph is him talking about, so most of the, most of the travel is, it's all, it's rivers and lakes, but a lot of it he's going upstream because because of the direction he's traveling in i don't the other thing to mention as well is he's going in that direction rather than the other direction it's all to do with breakup which is the thaw um which doesn't where he starts he starts at the beginning of june and the ice is just breaking up but about halfway 
into his quest, he gets to Great Bear Lake, the ice is still there, huge great chunks of ice, unnavigable. So there is a pressure, there's a time pressure on this quest of doing it after breakup and before the, the new winter, the next winter's freeze starts in September. Um, so also to put that in our minds, those of us who live in our nice temperate zones, that actually there's still ice in June <laughs> um, and it's going to start again in September. The summer is tiny. So there's that time pressure and also one would think that that would give the book a sort of an internal pace because we're all, we know we've got to achieve by a certain, you know, date. Great. But actually, it, that doesn't, that, that, that pressure, that pace, it, we just don't feel it in the book. I think partly because I tried to work this out when I finished it. I think he only mentions the date on about four occasions. So all the time we're reading, you know, he'll say three days later or four days or whatever we're not really clear where we are either on the map um because on the map it doesn't give any dates of what he achieves by certain dates and also in the text there aren't those dates so as, as a reader it feels a bit well i don't know where i am in time or space so it all becomes just one samey blur it's all sort of, you know, oh, I've got to tackle this river. I'm going, I'm going up river rather than down river. I'm going to be paddling against the flow. Oh, I can't paddle, so I'm going to have to pole. There's not enough depth of water, so he poles sort of punts. Or, you know, he gets to some rapids and he puts his waders on and he gets out of the canoe and he drags the canoe behind him up through rapids. And then he appears at a lake and, oh, you know, I had to cross the lake. And then there's another lake beyond it, which I had to cross. And then there's a river I have to get up and there's rapids and I have to portage the canoe around the rapids. And portage is really difficult. And he just does that over and over and over again. And there are, there are phrases he uses over and over again. He, he talks about, oh, I've got to be careful when I'm wading and pulling the canoe because I, you know, I could get my foot stuck and twist my ankle. He uses that phrase, twist my ankle or trip and smash my head over and over again. It's like, yeah, Adam, we get it. It's dangerous. <laughs> um, it's always, you know, every... Ev Every paragraph, not every paragraph, but it feels like every paragraph starts with him saying, this is going to be difficult, if not impossible. And at the end, it's always, you know, I was exhausted at the end of the day. I ate my dinner, I was exhausted. I fell into my tent, I was exhausted. Uh, yeah, so massively repetitive. And back to that reference about him being a loner, like Rana finds, and a bit, you've got to be a bit mad to even think about doing that. There were a lot of times that, that he comes over as, and this is what I mean, I, I'm not taking anything away from the achievement. It is remarkable. But the writing, it sounds like a 15-year-old remembering what he did that summer and trying to big it up to impress his dad and mum. And I felt like you don't need to. We 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 get it. It's dangerous. Um, I, I think my main conclusion is: look, he's without doubt he's an amazing man in terms of as an explorer and pushing boundaries. But as a writer, <laughs> no, he's really dull. Sorry, it's dull as ditch water, and it shouldn't be. I wish what he'd done, because he kept a journal while he was doing it, I wish he'd handed his journals over to a ghost writer or a writer, um, do interviews and let someone else write it. Also, I think the editing, the editor ought to have picked up on this repetition of twisted ankle, smash my head, the words difficult, the words exhausted, an editor could have picked up on that, and I think you could have made the book shorter, a bit more pithy. Um, there was something else I wanted to say. Oh, yes, about that pace. So, in essence, he is a man who... He's, he talks about it a lot right at the beginning, and then again at the end, there's an afterword, just a few pages, when he talks about the wilderness and how precious it is and how we have to 
you know, we need to try and preserve it. Yeah, here, here. And along the way, occasionally he'll mention a wolf that is watching him. He has a couple of um, encounters with bears. He talks about some birds. But they're really scant. The mentions of the wildlife are scant. And ultimately what I felt was that this book ought to have been an ode to wilderness, an ode to the beauty of it and what all the all the flora and fauna that manages to survive there and how remarkable that is and, and tell us about it. But he rarely does because he's always it, it, this obsession with, oh, I've got to paddle for 13 hours today. Oh, I paddled for 11 hours today. It, it feels like all he wants to tell us in the book is how hard he worked. And, and it's obvious he worked hard. Again, not taking that away from him. But to keep telling me it's 11 hours of paddling today or 13 hours or whatever it is. After a while, I don't want to hear about that. I want to hear about the landscape and the flora and fauna. And I had this desperate desire for him all the way through. And then it really came to the fore in my mind at the end of I wanted him to just stop, just stop and be there and and appreciate it and soak it up and share that with us, the reader. And you know, he talks about at the end about how, you know, we, we really need to appreciate this. We, we can't do without it, etc., etc. But yet for four months he's hardly given us a moment of that so yeah it's it's a bit of an odd one um i kept like i said i'm just quickly looking at my notes to see if i've forgotten anything i i i did want him to just stop for a minute and and share and share this amazing amazing place with us and there are a couple of times when he gets iced in at um Great Bear Lake, and just remember to want to say the correct names. I think it's Great Bear Lake, which again we look at it on a map and we think, oh yeah, it's a lake. We know about lakes in the in the UK. We know about the lakes in the Lake District. <laughs> what it'd be great. Also on here, there's no there's no scale, there's no mile scale. So we just look at that and think, oh yeah, lake. I recognise what a lake is. We've got them in the Lake District. Now, this is more like a sea <laughs> than a lake. But he does get iced in for a short time. And there are a couple of moments I was thinking, yes, yes, this is what we want as a reader. This is what I want as a reader. When he starts to describe some of what's around him. I really wanted that. But then, oh no, he's off again. And look, I understand there was the time pressure of those four months. I just think, he's not a great writer, <laughs> sorry. Uh... I don't think the editing was great. I think we could have taken, we could afford to lose half of the paddling descriptions and replace them with descriptions of, of the natural world that he was right there in the thick of. It says at the top, national bestseller in Canada. This has come from Canada. I'm not surprised, yes. If I was Canadian, I would read it too. And I'm not Canadian and I wanted to read it. I just think uh, it's a shame because the book, the writing, unfortunately, it's dull. And what a shame when what he did is anything but dull. Like I say, it's utterly remarkable mind-blowing, mind-blowing. What an absolutely ridiculous, crazy idea in the first place. And he only went and did it. Amazing. So hats off to him as an explorer. Sadly, it's a bit of a thumbs down to the book. But thank you, Pat, for sending it. I really appreciated having the opportunity um, to read it. Now, um, I'm briefly going to introduce this, this is a clip from a few weeks ago. I don't know when you'll see this. It might be more than a few weeks ago by now. And this is all about um, this. So I want to end on a high. See Shaken Houses, which was a fantastic, remarkable read. Absolutely 
just wonderful and joyous. So you'll see that clip following now. In fact, without further ado, let's pop that clip in um, and have a quick recap of what I thought of Sea Shaken Houses. So this book picked it up and I, I can't believe I hummed and hawed about it for a minute. So I had it in my hand and I continued browsing. It's second hand. I got it from the second hand shop. I continued browsing and I had it in my hand still. And then I went to sit down to have a close look at it. Honestly, why did I hum and haw? It, it was a, it's a no brainer. So it's called, the title is brilliant. See, Shaken Houses, it's a bit of a mouthful, See Shaken Houses by Tom Nancolas. Um, subtitle, A Lighthouse History from Eddystone to Fastnet. You see, those are those names again. The, it's this guy's first book. I think it was 2018. Let me just double check the publication date. Yeah, 2018. I wonder if he's written anything subsequently. I'd love to read anything. Very simply put, there's eight chapters and an interlude chapter, and it's specifically looking at our rock lighthouses. So there are lighthouses that are built out to sea, not the ones on the land. Oh, God, it's brilliant. What an absolute romp of a read. It kept me up really late one night, then the next day I had to finish it. <laughs> it's brilliant. So, uh wonderful it deals with three of my favorite favorite things anyway architecture engineering and the sea but way more besides it's history uh it's sort of part travelogue because he goes around the country visiting these various places so we get a sense of the place on shore that this lighthouse is sort of attached to by a ribbon of sea um it it's there's physics in there electricity the first kind of you know trying to harness and use electricity parabolic reflectors lenses it's a smorgasbord uh couldn't put it down so this guy he is a building conservator does conservation on buildings and it was while he was doing his, I can't remember if it was his degree or his master's, when he was doing his dissertation, he was trying to find a subject that was a bit more niche, maybe other people haven't looked at it. So he looked at conservation of these beautiful um, lighthouse buildings of ours. The most recent rock lighthouse to be constructed, it's 1904 or seven, hang on a second. 1904 is the most recent rock lighthouse that's been built, and that's the one at Fastnet. So these buildings are buildings worthy of, you know, he's talking about, you know, conservation. It's, I mean, it was fascinating. I'm trying to, I'm trying to formulate my words now. I'm a bit in awe, actually. I, I finished it yesterday and I want to start straight away again to read it again. It's really packed with information, but it's really, really easy to read. He's got a lovely con conversational style um, and everything flows. There is, a, there's quite a lot of technical stuff in there, but it doesn't boggle one's mind. It's, it's written and explained in such a way as the lay person can easily understand. What it made me think as I was closing it last night is, I feel like we take lighthouses for granted in a way. And it comes back to that RNLI thing that of, that these are buildings, they are, um, oh, I've forgotten the word, what's the word? It's, there's something incredibly altruistic about them because it's not about making money, although they did once upon a time. It's not about making money. It's about saving lives, hopefully saving lives. And it's not even about saving British lives. It's about saving the lives of anyone and everyone who comes into these waters. Uh, but yeah, it was really fascinating. So yeah, sorry, back to that fact of I think we take them for granted. I I'm sure, I mean, you know, think about when we go to the seaside for our holidays and we see gift shops, there'll be a little, a little clay or wooden lighthouse amongst all the stuff. 
images of lighthouses on fabric prints, on, on bunting. I think I did some bunting with lighthouses on once. Um, you know, curtains, cushions, that lighthouse, the image of a lighthouse, it's going to be on all your gear, on some or some of the gear you buy from a gift shop when you're, when you're on holiday at the seaside. And I'm I'm willing to bet that if you asked a child to draw to, I'm giddy and I'm excited. I know I'm talking too quickly. I slow down. I reckon if we asked any child, can you draw me a picture of a lighthouse? We'd get that with the light on the top and maybe red and white stripes. It's always red and white stripes, isn't it? So there are these, they are buildings with which we are so familiar, but yet how many of us really understand A, how they work and B, how they were built? Uh, have you ever visited a lighthouse? Uh, I know, I know two lighthouses fairly well, the one at Portland and Anvil Point, which is the one nearest my grandparents. Um, I'm just suddenly feeling a bit chilly I've, I've cooled down since I was out so I'm just going to put on my my sister poncho that's better that will be better the one at Anvil Point do I carry on with my point I was making or talk about Anvil Point I'll talk about Anvil Point in a minute but yeah I think we are all like I said really familiar with what does the lighthouse look like we can Right now, I'm sure the majority of you can conjure the image of a lighthouse in your mind. We could all draw one, probably, never mind just the kids. I had a fairly good idea of how they work from having visited a few, from sometimes seeing things on the telly or what have you. But in terms of how they were built, the rock lighthouses, the ones out to sea, I mean, I had no idea. And the more I read, the more in utter, utter awe I was of, of the engineering of the audacity to even try it in the first place. The first one at Ediston was 1600 and late 1600s, a handy little table at the back, 1698. 1698, the first offshore, if you like, lighthouse was attempted. Crazy. So yeah, I think it's, look, it's an incredibly niche title, book, an incredibly niche subject, but actually, especially for those of us in the UK, we live on an island, we're surrounded by the sea, it's so much a part of all of our lives. Pretty much most of the shopping that you will do in your high street will have come in on a ship, unfortunately. Um... Yeah, it's it's utterly fascinating, totally fascinating. I'm so glad I've read it and have a much much better understanding of the whole of the whole gig now, not just the actual building. Of course, most of them have been, as it's called, demand by now. Um, I think the, all the all the rock like houses they're saying have been demand. It's all automatic. I think the Majority, I think there was one left, it might even have been Fastnet, where they're, they're all now solar powered rather than diesel. At the time he wrote this, Fastnet was still diesel because he was out there. He managed to get to go out to Fastnet with the maintenance crew. Yeah, fascinating stuff. I hope you uh, stayed to watch that bit about sea shaken houses, and I apologise for the slightly abrupt ending. But I then went on to talk about all sorts of other things that that book had prompted. Memories, thoughts. I went on to chat for another, oh goodness me, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes about, about my memories of tides and sea houses, lighthouses, sea houses and fog horns, etc, etc. Um, you can see all that in the original the, the video that I originally made a few weeks ago, it's called uh, My Sister the Sea and Me, if I recall correctly. And what I'll do is at the end of this video, I'll put one of the cards up. So if you click on it, you can see the original video with all the, all the other thoughts that flew around um, having read that wonderful book. Who's it by again? Tom Nancollis. <clears throat> 
Tom Nancollis. So yeah, it's uh, what what I'm just picking up my Adam again. What a contrast! What a huge contrast! Um, but you know what? I think the thing is, even when this one again, even when I read a book, like I said, it ended up just being dull, and. I can't remember the last time I skim read a book. Just wanted to get to the end. Just get there, be done. Uh, I can't remember the last time I did that, which says a lot, doesn't it? But even so, I'm grateful to have been given the book. I'm grateful for the opportunity to read it because I had no idea about that expedition that had happened. It's a part of the world where I feel like I know some parts of it, but more heading towards Alaska um, so it's wonderful to read something that I'm I feel like there's some familiarity but then whoa <laughs> I didn't know it turns out there's so much more that I didn't know so it's even though it was yeah even though it was really really dull it's not wasted on me because I learned things and that's always that's always great isn't it and my imagination kind of filled in <laughs> some of the blank dull bits so yeah it's never a waste of time is it and i think if it if yeah if it had i was gonna say how long do you give a book that you're not really into if i hadn't been into it at all i'd say probably you know, within the first quarter of the book, which would have been about 65 odd pages or so, if within those first 65 pages, you know, I I didn't care for it, I wouldn't pursue it. Life's too short to read a book that's rubbish. With this one, though, <laughs> the first 65 pages were really engrossing. Anyway, look, the point is, if you're not really enjoying a book, don't bother, chuck it. Um, because there's so many amazing, wonderful fun quick lovely reads out there don't don't persist with a book you're not enjoying or skim read it get to the end find out what happened all right lovelies i will see you all again really soon i hope um i don't know what i'll be doing i don't know what we'll be chatting about but we'll be doing and chatting about something so until then happy reading take care cheerio lovelies